Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And on this special episode of Wandering DMs, we have as our guest Peter Beaverigal, who is the editor of Appendix N, The Eldritch Roots of Dungeons and Dragons, which is an anthology of the very best short stories that come out of Gygax's. I mean, <clears throat> viewers of the show, of course, know Gygax's very famous Appendix N appearing in the back of the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide where he presents the most important inspirational reading that inspired D&D. Peter, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Really fun. So your Appendix N anthology, The Eldritch Roots of Dungeons & Dragons, this is one of my uh, favorite uh, books that I have been introduced to uh, through the Wandering DMs show. Thank you so much for appearing oh, today. I devoured this in like about three days. I was like, I'm going to take it real slow. I'm going to enjoy it. But about three days later, I'm like, well, I guess I, I'm done with that. <laughs> and of course, you know, myself and Paul and viewers of the show are, of course, you know, very familiar with, you know, some of the pieces in here by Lovecraft and Vance and Howard and Anderson and a whole bunch of other people. But there were a number of new discoveries for me that I had not managed to pick up before. And I was just so overjoyed to find out that there's there's more stuff for me to continue digging into, and that's that was a really delight for your uh, for for you to present it. Um, so I mean, just for just for viewers, of course, uh, this I think this was released in in hardcover last year. Uh, the paperback version came out February of this year. So yeah, the um, hardcover so was tough. Five hundred limited edition, so unfortunately, there's no longer any of those available, and it came um, with a little. Uh, chat book as well so um uh so yeah that's unfortunately not not available anymore um but i do want to make sure i give a shout out to the publisher strange attractor uh they are a small uh uk publisher run by mark pilkington and jamie sutcliffe and they're they do you know very small uh, curated sort of uh, books that they love and they are expert bookmakers as well um, and so um, working with them was really amazing they everything that they do is is a work of art just in terms of the physical look and feel of the book so I want to make sure to, to sort of note you know that the, the thing itself is is whether I did a good job or not is irrelevant to just how great the book itself looks as a as a you know as a physical thing. One of the first things that struck me opening it up is that you have a blue style uh, dungeon map on the fold out front and back covers, uh, which which immediately was like oh yeah sweet <laughs> yeah. and it's a little it's a little jokey actually because the the encounter areas. Uh, uh, are keyed to stories uh, in the book. Actually. Yes, exactly. But what, yes. what a beautiful! I'm like these are the people. These are the people, and they know what they're doing. So yeah, it's as an artifact. It's a it's a beautiful thing. Totally. Yeah. Great. The conceit was that as you read each, as you go through the map, you're sort of in the space of the story. Doesn't really work <laughs> perfectly, yeah. but just to give it a just to be able to present uh, the stories themselves as you know as the map descriptions i thought was a, a neat way to frame it you're in a liminal space i think i think i get it <laughs> yes exactly exactly uh peter our, our one of our viewers is asking if there's an electronic edition available or is it just the paperback right now just the paperback unfortunately it ha that has a lot to do with the uh the rights and we can actually talk about yeah. talk about that which is um, an interesting yeah. part of Trying to get access to a lot of these things. I, um, there, there was there's some um, uh, an understanding, which is a misunderstanding, which is that uh, the people think as most of these stories are in the public domain. They're actually not. There's of the list. There's only a handful um, that are available right now in the public domain. You know, soon more and more will will become available, but. Most of these required either permissions from estates, um, from the authors themselves, for the few that were actually living. Wow. And though I would say that, you know, as much as 
finding and deciding which stories I wanted um, and then putting them together, m most of the work was acquire, trying to acquire the rights for these, trying to track down who might own them, especially for things that originally appeared in, in pulps mm -hmm. where those were often work for hires, you know, um, so sort of uh, specking all that out. And it was fascinating to sort of learn the world of, especially for things that might not be that well known, that there are still people that are, you know, actively making sure that these things are, um, are taken care of in terms of, of their histories and, and who owns them. And if you want to use them, it's not free. So, you know, there's, there's still a lot of, um, a lot of people that aren't the authors or even their families that still really care a lot about these, these stories. That's great. That's actually great. Let's, let's, let's table the details on, let, let's be clear about what's actually in the book. So Paul, I have the, the table of contents, um, uh, probably the next yeah, there you go. So uh, I know it's real small on the screen, but there's actually the table of contents. So I think there's 17 uh, pieces in Peter's appendix and anthology here. And um, you know, to be clear, it's not, I guess a purist, I suppose, might uh, critique the fact that it's not actually 100% things named in Gygax's appendix N. Um, there are stories from authors that he mentions that, that he didn't mention the story, there's also two pieces that you included from uh, Tom Moldvay's basic d and inspiration reading. And, of course, we're big fans of Moldvay. If you look behind uh, Paul's uh, uh, shoulder there Let's on the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the shelf, we've got, we've got Tom Moldvay's thing, one of our favorite editions, as a matter of fact. Mine so too. tell us how you pick the things that are in the anthology. Why are there some stories that Gygax didn't specifically mention? Why did you f pick a couple things out of Moldvay? Sure. So there's some absolute practical things when trying to put together an anthology, right? So first of all, um, I decided early on that I did not want novel excerpts. They're not fun to read. They're out of context. You have to have a lot of introductory material to make them interesting to the reader. And they end up being something that's more like a sample rather than having a full experience with, with what the author's trying to do. So I didn't want this to be a sampler. It's not, right? So that was number one. And that, that suddenly really constricted what I was going to be able to do here. So then I had to ask myself, what did I want this anthology to be? What's the spirit that I was trying to capture? Because even though I wasn't going to be able to use novel excerpts, certainly many of the authors for whom only novels are named were still writing in that vein it le even you know in in short in their short work so i figured there was still a dotted line to get from an author's novel to a short story that still captured what it was that they were doing in that work and that i hoped that gygax would himself have said oh yeah Exactly. This is exactly the kind of thing that I meant when I only named um, the novels. The other thing he does, and, and this is where I think people will say that I maybe took advantage, but I don't think so, is that more often than not, you're going to see in the original Appendix N where he says, at all. And I took that at all very, very seriously. It, at all means and everything else by this author. Okay? <laughs> if he didn't mean it, he wouldn't have put it in. So, yeah. right? And so um, I took that very seriously. Somebody once said, um, you know, in the end, it might have been that Appendix N was really when he wrote down the actual names of the novels, what he saw on his bookshelf in front of him when he was writing it. Right, right. right? But then we said, oh, but Paul Anderson, sure, of course. You know, I wouldn't expect that, um, you know, or, or say, you know, P.J. Farmer or whoever, you know, uh, Fritz Lieber, that, that of course I would want folks to be looking at their other work or that I was inspired by their other work. Certainly I'm, you know, um, taking probably some liberties there. 
The other thing I realized I was I wanted to do was I really wanted to capture um, D and D as I love D and D, which was that it was weird. That D and D is weird, you know, um, and that there's a sword and sorcery element bound up in that weirdness that I wanted to try to uh, convey. I also wanted to try to convey that if these were influencing D&D, maybe part of what they were influencing for Gygax was the shape of a narrative. That there's a hero or heroes or uh, protagonists that are having to encounter some thing that they have to fight through and get to the other side of um, for whatever reason. Maybe it's riches, maybe it's just to stay alive, maybe it's for some other greater purpose, right? Um, so that also meant that there are things in, in his list that, to tell you the truth, don't even really make sense to me anyways, and that I felt easy enough to cut out because... Look, the book could only be so long. The anthology could only be so long. It could only have so many stories. We only had a certain the budget for the for the rights. But there are also folks whose um, their output just didn't seem to match up with the spirit that I personally wanted to convey. And look, I'm the editor, right? So I decided what I thought would be fun for the reader. Um, so stuff by like Jack Williamson and Stanley Weinbaum, they seem to be more science fiction. Um, or more in sort of that spirit of, of sort of the, the sort of speculative fiction tale and didn't really have the sword and sorcery elements or at least um, sensibility that, that I was trying to capture in the anthology. So once I understood what my parameters were for myself as an editor, then I could just go and look for stories. Um, and so, you know, again, some of the limitations were also, um, once I knew what I wanted, I simply couldn't get the rights. Hmm. It was either too expensive, um, the estates never got back to me, um, I had a very, uh, I had a couple of, um, uh, for example, Fox Gardner's estate, I wanted to have a Kothar story, which I thought, if you, you know, given the anthology, would have fit perfectly but they just decided that they weren't giving rights because they were eventually going to do, they're eventually going to do their own anthology. So, you know, a lot of that was just uh, prohibitive as well. Fascinating. Paul, do you have a question a couple minutes ago? Uh, uh, yeah, I think we kind of blew past it, but actually I'm kind of curious, what are the two specific Moldvay stories uh, that, that, made, that made it into the list? Well, so I would say they're not so much, they're not specific as that, they, that those authors are mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so the first is Clark Ashton Smith's Necro Empire of the Necromancers. And, you know, I, I would say that I am completely puzzled that Guy Gax does not include Clark Ashton Smith on his list. Right. In other, after the anthology came out, I had read that some folks say that he actually did not like Clark Ashton Smith and purposely kept him out. Uh, so it wasn't that he didn't encounter him, it's just that he chose. So, all right, I'll give him that. Maybe then this shouldn't have been included, but come on. <laughs> you know, for the spirit of D&D... To not have uh, Clark Ashton Smith, so I'll own that. You know that that was my sneaky addition because I would never want to put out an anthology like this with not a Clark Ashton without a Clark Ashton Smith. And, story. I, and I mean, one of the most you know popular D and D modules that go with the BX set, right, is I believe Module X two Castle Amber, right, is totally inspired by Clark Ashton Smith stuff. People people adore that 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 adventure right. module. So, um, yeah, yeah, fascinating. Yep. Yep. And then the other is C.L. Moore's Black God's Kiss. And again, I'm going to go ahead and say Gygax must have encountered C.L. Right. Moore in the pulps. Impossible to have right. missed her work. Um, and so because she's mentioned in the Mold Bay, that gave me what I felt was license enough to say it was just, you know, 
an, an error, an editor's error on the part of, of Gygax at the time. And let's be clear about that because, because that, again, that was one of my favorite discoveries actually is the Moore story, Black God's Kiss, because I feel that that, that directly points a finger at a, at a particular adventure of Gygax's. Um, what, I mean, if, what, what do you think I'm thinking of, Peter? Let's see. I mean, there's this whole otherworldly, uh, almost planar travel in that, but I can't think. What would you say? But it's underground, and it's in a big, yes. it's in a big space underground. Yes. Does so, Paul know? so for me, <laughs> Paul's played it. I've DM'd it with Paul actually, <laughs> and, and we've we've talked about it in the past because it's something that Paul found actually kind of unsettling in a couple ways. Is I feel that I feel that the CL Moore story is very much like Vault of the Drought. Oh, very uh, interesting. AD&D, yeah. D3 yes. in a large underground space, and there's stars overhead for some reason, and it's murky, and it's it, it, you can see one way, and you can see another depending on what st- situation you're in. And, you know, the Vault of the Drow adventure has long been my favorite, favorite uh, adventure of Gygax's, and when I read it, like, I, I, I it, it felt very, you know, a, a great artistic flourish. And yeah. when I when I run it as DM, I really try to spend a lot of time trying to get that flavor across. And reading the Moore story made me go, "Oh, that's you know maybe he didn't have it on his desk when he was writing it, but it seems like this is the stuff that got into his head at one point that came yes. that, that burbled forth as the vault of the drow." So yeah. that for me that was a necessary discovery, and I'm so glad you've got it in the anthology. It's great, and it's also interesting because it's a very it's a decidedly Christian religious tale, right? I mean, she is fighting against, she's having to um, make a deal, right? It is ultimately that her will risk her very soul to get back to what is actually ultimately a sort of Christian uh, kingdom, Right. So it's very interesting in that way. And, you know, as somebody obviously was very religious, you know, I can't imagine that he wouldn't have been influenced by that. But it's fine if he wasn't. And it's fine if this is a mistake or an error. I still think it's a great story. I still think it it has a place here. Um, the other, there are a couple, though, that you won't see that you will. Um, and this is, again, could prove controversial in terms of purists about um, where some of these stories come from. Um, so one of the very interesting inclusions in the original Appendix N is the Offutz, uh Swords Against Darkness 3, which he edited, which was at the time, you know, a popular collection of um, sword and sorcery tales in the, in the early mid-70s and, and into, the late, into the later part of the, the decade. What's interesting about it is, for me, is is a couple of things. First, why only the third volume? Why not one and two? The fourth, it could be argued, came out after um, the first edition DM's Guide was published, so it wouldn't likely that he had read that one. But the fact that he only included three, I, again, went a little bit to say maybe we could say... <laughs> He also had read one and two, but in either event, um, we do have an important two stories in here that do come from three, which is uh, Ramsey Campbell's Pit of Wings, which is an absolutely fantastic story, but more importantly, scary. yes, really scary. Right. Um, yeah. Yep. The story that I'd love to talk with you about specifically because I really think it's the prize of this anthology is um, Tower of Darkness by David Madison. David Madison um, was part of a very small zine stir writers at the time, right? When they, you know, a lot of a lot of what these stories and these authors got their start in were sort of these 60s, early 70s science fiction and fantasy zines. And it was a small community of people, right? And you, um, and so he's has a very small output of stories, David Madison. And I was to find out later that he died very young, actually took his own life, yeah. um, 
And I, I hope you don't mind if I tell you this little anecdote because I think it, it, it was part of what made doing this so special. Um, I really, really wanted this story, but I couldn't find anything about him except that he had written the story that appeared in Sword of Against Darkness and a few others. And I decided to take a chance and look. I, I looked all over Google. I couldn't find anything. I think I actually went to the Wayback Machine to see if maybe something would come up from there. And I found an old blog post uh, by this woman, um, Amanda Salmonson. And she was writing a sort of mem in memoriam for him because they had been friends at the time um, in the early 70s, part of this zine culture. And that they had, it's a bizarre story, but they had made essentially, they were both suffering from, uh, you know, mental illness of some kind at the time or struggling with, with the culture and the community at the time. And they made a pact that they would not commit suicide as long as the other was, old. like, that was their oh. thing, that they were not going to do that. But he ended up doing it. I wrote to her, I found her on Facebook of all places, sent her a note and just said, I found this blog post of yours. I don't know if you know, but I really want to use this story by David Madison in this anthology, told her all about it. Would you happen to know who holds the rights? Within an hour, she wrote me back and she said, I'm actually the holder of his estate and I would love to like, wow. use this story. Wow. Uh, so that was really something, and I really feel like, and, and it's such a great story. Like it, all that work was not for like a one-off. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it a is. fantastic tale that a lot of the folks who have read this anthology will often point out that story as being the one that they were most excited to have read that they had never heard about. Yeah, and it, you know, it opens up. It's got two great characters, right? So you have the you know the the kind of classic situation of. Uh, a wandering pair of adventurers, incredibly strong characters. You've got, you know, a striking, strong woman named Diana. You have a uh, kind of thiefly uh, type named Marcus with her, with her, and he wears mascara and and a butterfly tattoo. If I if I think <laughs> yes. I'm his cheek, right. And yes. I feel like you know, modern and there's an implication players, that she's gay. Yeah, it, it's not. Or at least, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's enjoy. It's, things they, with whomever right. like that sort of like, right yeah right they, they, they feel you know if, if you said these these are non-binary characters I, I could I could absolutely believe that and I feel like modern players could totally fall in love with this and and want a whole series written about these characters and yes. of course they wind up in a city with a weird religious structure that winds up that they're kind of in a bad in a bad state <laughs> to be there right yeah. at that moment um, yeah and and I agree. It's a, it's a wonderful story, and, th and what a what a touching uh, a backstory to um, to how you got that. That is that's amazing that that more people are going to get to see that. Yeah, yep. And then you know, again, the other interesting thing is of the authors here, um, only two are still alive: um, Michael Moorcock and Ramsey Campbell. And so. That was great because I got to actually talk to them directly. Um, and I had had a couple of interactions with Moorcock. In any case, I'd written a profile about him for the New Yorker website. Um, and um, not to toot any horns or anything, but he was kind enough to blurb one of my earlier books. So I had had a relationship. I felt it was easy enough to just contact him. And he was, you know, uh, worked with his wife to make sure that I acquired those rights. Um, and also, Ramsey Campbell was very generous, very nice. He actually had the his original sort of um, that that he had transcribed later, and so that I got to um, you know get the file from him, you know, uh, to try wow. to you know to, to, to edit and, and get it into shape. So that was fun. Um, which was also an interesting thing about this because a lot of the I was so dependent on the internet's archival, you know, wonders. Um, there's something called the Internet Science Fiction Database, which proved invaluable, invaluable for finding stories and where they were originally published. Um, just an incredible resource. And then archive.org, 
to find some of these pulps that then, I mean, literally what we had to do was I had to download them as PDFs, turn them into editable PDFs, try to render those into some kind of readable <laughs> Word doc. You know, we had to sort of really, but, but without those internet resources, I don't know how this would have come together. Fascinating. Fascinating. And of course, the work that you just mentioned is very similar. Of course, you know, a friend of the show, John Peterson, um, who does you know historical work for Dungeons and Dragons. And he still says that a large part of the work is just finding the materials that haven't been digitized, just scoping out what exists so far. And the, you know, the main, you know, writing thesis work still has yet to be done in the future. So that's very, that kind of work is very familiar to us. Totally. Yep. Something. Maybe tell us about some of the pieces that were near misses. Like so, um, you mentioned the Fox Gardner work. What other what other pieces were you pursuing and couldn't quite uh, manage to nab? Yes, I really wanted the um, less darkness that the Sprague to Camp story. Um, uh, it has where he meets Odin. Um, could not get that from the from the estate. Um, I thought that I was not going to be able to get Conan. I figured, oh my gosh, really? this is going to be terrible. And that was one of the easiest, nicest really? ones. <laughs> sure, take it. What do you need? Really great. Um, so that was really nice. Um, I was not able to get an Andre Norton story because just for whatever reason, the... Um, the um, the folks, um, you know, didn't want to give the rights. I, I was close to getting a Jack a Roger Zelazny story, but in the end, it just didn't it just didn't fit. So um, that that may be on the table if we do a second edition. Um, so um, and Lay Bracket was also one that I couldn't I wasn't able to acquire just again for some rights issues. But um, and then the other thing again is there were folks that just didn't fit. Um, I just didn't like, you know, for whatever reason. Again, you know, I had to sort of keep things smallish. Obviously, I wasn't going to get Tolkien in there. The only excerpt that I was going, to, after all that I said about not wanting excerpts, okay. the only excerpt um, that I decided if I could get um, that I was going to use um, was from... Um, the Once and Future King. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what happened there was it was, there's a, there's a section um, where they meet uh, basically Robin Hood. And, um, and it's the perfect ranger story. They're going to find a witch's hut in the book. Um, and I, I really felt that it worked uh, on its own is just like a beautiful little tale, but that estate was so it was so expensive um, that I wasn't going to be able to that we weren't going to be able to afford it. So, and of course, Tolkien is listed in Gygax's Appendix N, even though later on maybe he he argued vociferously that Tolkien had nothing to do with the the background of D and D even though we can look at the earliest editions of original D&D, &D, and there's all kinds of references to Tolkien explicitly in the very first rule book. Um, right. So we, I, think, I think we all agree that he, he clearly has a lot of DNA that came through into D&D, &D, obviously. That's so right. I can see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, so um, some of these are, you know, that's, that was also from the Mold Bay to the, the TH White, but um, again, something that I... Uh, he must have read, you know, um, and just trying to add a little bit of um, what I thought might. But then there were things that were so obvious, right? Jack Vance, Paul Anderson, Lord Dunsany, Robert E. Howard, they said, Lovecraft. I mean, um, an Elric tale, right? These are just things that, even though I knew people had probably read, like, how could you build an anthology like this without those, right? I agree. I wasn't I trying to do that. anything so out necessarily out of, outside the box, you know. Right, right. I feel, I mean, reading this, I feel like you really hit the crown jewels, 
And I feel like, let, you know, maybe there's a very young player that's really new to D&D, and I would feel that if I wanted to give them one compact collection to know where the original creator's mindset was, this is perfect, perfect for that. And for me, yep. you know, I knew half of it, and half of it was still new. So I feel it's a really great, uh, it's a really great product, honestly, for both, you know, brand new players and older players to, you know, to discover new stuff wherever you are on the spectrum, so to speak. On the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, one, you know, one thing I noticed, you know, and of course we love all those authors. We, you know, the very first one you mentioned there in that list was Jack Vance. And just a week ago, we had on um, the people from Frog God Games who are currently oh, making great. a big yes. Jack Vance Dying Earth that's right. Uh, DCC yep. uh, a game, and we, we love that, and they're doing so well, and people should go look at that Kickstarter, of course. Um, and so we were talking all about Jack Vance's work just last week. One thing I noticed is that I feel like most of those authors, you know, who wound up writing a series, I feel like you included the very first story. Like, I think you, you, you include the very first Dying Earth story from Jack Vance. I think Turgeon of Mirror is the first. Yes. You included yep. the very first Faffer and the Grey Mouser story, the very first Elric story. Was that intentional? Yes. Did you pick the first one, or did you feel that those were the best ones? Um, I think I, well, do this. I, I adore that um, Lieber story. It, I, I do think it, it's so weird too, which is, you know, um, so I just think that that story captured them at their best. And it just so happens to be, yes, that it was the thing. I also feel like um, Elric, that also just made sense for somebody maybe that had never read an Elric story, even though where it gets inserted, <laughs> you know, into the larger mythology doesn't start at the beginning in that way. Um, and I do think there's better... Um, I think the, that the novel Elric of Melonbone is, I think, one of the great Moorcock novels, you know, so it depends on how you want to sort of get into it, but I do think that that functions. Um, and I don't know why, I think the Vance also, part of the reason why I wanted that is because it's the classic story that has the spell names, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that was sort of, it's also, it's a, it's a bizarre tale, um, but I, I love that it really captures how magic works for Vance, right? That we will see ultimately in, in the in the game itself. Yeah. Totally. It's totally. also very interesting because it's it's hard to discern when Gary says these influence the game, what can actually be pulled out to say these made it into the rules themselves. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about just Appendix N in general and how you think you can can you read Appendix N in first edition D and D? Well, boy, what a great question! Paul, so, I mean, that, this was one of the things I was going to ask you, Peter. Honestly, one of my one of my main bullet points was like, what lessons can you know new or old DMs take out of Appendix N? Paul, what do you what do you feel about? I mean, I I, I'll, yeah. I have an opinion, but do you feel that you can read like a classic story and point out specific things that got into D and D? Specific. Like specific elements, characters, uh, or I, I feel like it's more thematic. I guess I would say I feel like it, yeah. it's it's um, yeah that that sort of uh, picaresque type stories or stories that uh, that focus on on characters who live in the moral gray area. Um, I feel like that thematically exists in D and D. I wonder if I'm just project now. I'm, now I'm getting very analytical of myself. Like, am I just projecting <laughs> my own my my own take on what I like out of D and D into the I mean, obviously, the, the Vance, uh, the spell names, I mean, that's the most obvious one, right? Like, right. Like right, really right, right. Their spell names yeah. right in there. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Dan, what do you think? Are there, are there like, specific classes that are just po obviously pointing at, at characters from, from books? I, 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 there is, and I think that you could, like, honestly, I spend a lot of time trying to um, uh, track down exactly those where did this bit come from originally in the literature. And I feel like it's really easy for spells. So in the Turgeon Amir Vance story, you've got the excellent prismatic spray. Um, you have the, uh, the, the spell of the long hour, which is essentially time stop. So I actually do feel like in a lot of cases, um, 
you know, there's a specific Conan story that I feel has someone casting a fireball. There's a specific story where someone makes a wall of fire and specifically casts like a whole person spell that, that affects the exact number of people that it does in original D&D. So I feel like it's easy to spot that kind of, um, that kind of elemental stuff for spells or monsters or magic items. Like somewhere in Vance, there's, a, there's Boots of Levitation, which work in the inverse way because it works by you kick somebody and they start levitating. Um, <laughs> but but you can kind of you can kind of see how it got you know telephone tagged into something slightly different. So I feel you can spit spot a lot of things like that. People point to Anderson's three hearts and three lions as the inspiration for the paladin class. Yep. Um, so I feel you know you mentioned that you know obviously the ranger coming out of Tolkien is almost one of the very first subclasses yeah, in d absolutely. I feel like you can, right. you can spot yeah. where that stuff yeah. came from, and I get really excited because if in original d d it was super terse, here's something that's very, that has a whole lot of narrative around it, and you can kind of dig into that and find out where the, the broader story was. So I really enjoy finding yeah. that stuff I, myself. I, I could say yeah. as, a, as a modern reader going back, and like that's for me, I didn't read a lot of this stuff until much later, like uh, when I only when I got back into old school D and D. So we're talking, you know, late two thousands, uh, and went, oh, I should actually read some of this inspirational stuff. Um, I felt like um, uh, Dranthian from uh, Elspreg the Camp's uh, Goblin Tower series was about the most dead on representation of a D and D thief of of any of the books oh, that I read, sure. right? Because he does all the like a lot of the skills. You could you could probably look at the list of thief skills and go through that book and find a case where Geranthian does pretty much everyone on that list. That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. And and even though Gygax would later sort of say be a little bit um less uh, uh excited about Tolkien, right? He says, No, no, I didn't really mean this to be Tolkien. Obviously orcs come from and right. even the elves that that notion of elves right i think um magic rings I, you know we have magic sword i mean so many of these again i think thematically is really what we're looking at i mean i think he's gone so far as there i would say that you know he uh, like especially early D D, a conan story looks like a D D adventure i think that's right that's the thing and again sort of you know it's a slightly chaotic good, good character right um and i think we can all agree in some ways that that really is the you know of all of these stories it's mostly chaotic good characters that we're seeing i mean you could maybe elric is is i don't even know if elric would be lawful evil but certainly you know yeah, he's actually started I, out as chaotic evil in Deities and Demigods. I'll just throw that. Yeah, out. that's right. Yeah, I think he's a little bit. I think he's still beholden, though, to the the rites and rituals of his people a little bit more. Can I just say for the record? And I said this before. Of all, of all the material that's ever been written about D and D, every book, every every adventure module from the first to the current five O, Deities and Demigods is my favorite book. Fascinating. Why, why is that? What, what, what shouts uh, out to you? I that? don't know what it is about <laughs> that. I, just, I love, first of all, it has some great artwork in it. Yeah. I love the idea that you never have it very far away, honestly. It's uh, never very far away. <laughs> within hands reach all the time yeah. for me. So in some ways I feel like it, you would never really use it, and yet it's, it's the best read. Hmm. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I have the I have the Lovecraft um, Elric version too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what this is. And I've I've said it a couple times. I've said it a couple times on the show. Of course, the entire the entire Cthulhu section is all uh, you know illustrated by Errol Otis. And for yes. example, when I was when I was young and I borrowed this initially, like this page right here, disgusted me so much that I never wanted to see it or touch it. And I actually trained myself to know physically where it is in the book, so I could always thumb past it and literally never touch this page. So yes. thank you, yep. thank you, Errol Otis. And yeah. at some point, if we get another show, I'm going to take him to task for completely screwing up my childhood. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, 
Yeah, I love the plain yeah. stuff in the back, the way it's all specked yeah. out. Yeah, it's yeah. just really fun. It kind of points to so many interesting things. I can see why that is, because it, even if you're not going to directly use very much of this in your game, it like, like I discovered Elric, right? If it hadn't been for deities and demigods, I wouldn't have known about Elric. And yeah. I wouldn't have known about um, Faf and the Grey Mouser. This is the first place yeah. that I discovered that stuff. Hmm. Have I ever used the monsters from the, from, the, from the new on section? No, I have not. But it, right. it opens so many doors for learning about real-world mythologies and literature and stuff like that, that um, it, it, it was an, an enormous yeah. influence on me as well. Yeah, it's yeah. like a great bibliography. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really well put. Peter, you mentioned um, that you didn't want to include excerpts from novels, uh, obviously for the just the sake of the, the format of the book. I'm curious if there are uh, specific novels that, like, if page count had not been a constraint, you would desperately have wanted to be in Appendix N. Yeah, that's a Great very good question. question. Yeah, I think I would like to have had something from Amber, the Amber series, mm. in there. Um, I think I would like to have had, um, like, for for um, Fred Saberhag and I do the, I kind of cheat and just have the poem about the swords, which I think is great. It's, it's very cool, and I think it fits um, with also the spirit of D&D to have these named swords, you know, that... Um, but I would like to have maybe had more than just that. Um, and the other thing is, I'm really, believe it or not, I think my big omission that I own that is is glaringly missing from this um, from this anthology is Edgar Rice Burroughs. Um, okay. And I think that you know, Great. but again, I just going over and over and over that material, I couldn't find an excerpt that I felt really just worked on its own. You know, everything's cliffhangery, everything, you know, just didn't, um, but I do, I do think that it's, it's, it does, um, it is a, um, it is a little bit of a black eye on the entire on it that, that he's, that he's not included, you know, um, let me ask about this. So I think it was personally, I feel it was the right decision to focus on actual short stories that you can get the beginning, middle, and end all within your anthology. Do you feel, you know, the, the, my, my education in pulp literature is that, you know, I live in a rural place, I'd go to the bookstore, I'd get a novel, I'd get a book this size. And uh, that was originally my, my fantasy literature upbringing. At a, at a fairly advanced age, it dawned on me that that so much of the literature was originally short stories, and you know, as one, I think the main, like one of the main snapping points for me is I do have an Elric anthology, and as you kind of um, touched on earlier, it's set in chronological order, and so the first number of stories are very large, but they were written later in life. That's right, and. For me, they, were, they, they slogged, and it was kind of a slog to get through them, and they were long, and they were kind of bloated, and I'm like, this isn't very good. What's going on? And I get to the middle part of the book, and then I get to the very first story that was ever written that you have in your anthology, of course, The Dreaming City, and it's like, it's like 25 pages or something like that, yeah. and he... Burns in a town, he's got a giant war fleet, he summons a fleet of fire-breathing dragons, he attacks the town, sacks the city, has a sword fight with his evil cousin, kills him, saves the princess, runs away in the cities, and I'm like, <laughs> right. that's the thing. What, that's, yeah, that's, that's why like all works right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, but, but why didn't I get this to begin with? So I feel like the, the short story really getting to the essence, and I mean, this is a thing that we talked about in the couple of literature classes I took in college, but the short story getting at the essence of this in a very punchy way, um, feels to me like it's the essence of the pulp literature. And yeah. later on, when for publishing purposes, these things had to get bulked up into novel-sized books, or a lot of them got put into like fix-ups where they weren't yeah, originally a novel, are, but they yes. tied together as a novel. Do you, do, you, do you agree with me that the short story is really the essence and the novel thing is kind of a is kind of a degenerate form in comparison. I think in a lot of cases, especially when it was the story that was first, you know, 
um, and then to try to turn those things into, um, you, like you said, to take take that and to try to, um, it becomes too thin, right? It loses that, like what you're talking about. Um, I think that like one of my favorite stories in this collection is the Tales of Hawk by Paul Anderson, um, which is not really part of anything except that it is part of his Viking stuff, which we see in the Broken Earth. Um, but I think everything that you want to know about Paul Anderson's vision of Vikings is in this story, in a, in a short tale about one monster, one problem to solve, but still gives this really amazing backdrop of that Viking life. Right, the journeys on the ships to come home, and how long you're away, the, the, the way the villages are set up, who's in charge, the family structure, all of that is in there. But it has a really cool monster. He has to um, use um, grappling rules. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's um, there's there's armor limitations. He gets negatives yeah. on his armor, like. It also functions as like a really great ruled story, you know. In that way, even though it's it's not mentioned, you know, he doesn't mention it in the, in the list. Uh, but it is, in, and this is also where I have to admit it's in Swords Against Darkness, but it's not in Swords Against Darkness three. It's in Swords Against Darkness one. So a little how bit dare, How there. dare you, sir? Right. All right. But I got the author. I got the themes. Yeah, I got all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a great story. It's such a great story. I'm so glad it's there. Uh, it really, it's so well written. I r had no idea how that was going to end. I mean, I just, I just read that like a week ago, and I, I was going into the ending. I'm like, this is, I have zero, this could absolutely go either way here at the end. I have no idea how it's going to turn out. Um, and it's it's wonderful. Paul, there's a great, I think there's a great comment by William yeah, uh, a minute gonna, or two ago. It's the I, last comment there. Yeah, I, uh, I was going to uh, call that one out myself here. Uh, so William writes, that short story format probably maps to a D and D session or module better too. Uh, is oh. that what you're thinking of, Dan? Is that the totally, yeah, totally? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, agree I agree with, with that. that. I do agree with that. Yeah. You need one big bad, basically. Right? You need one mystery to solve, one something. You know, and it, you get it in this. That's why Conan works so well, right? Yeah. And the Gray Mouser That's stuff works so well. You know. Totally. Totally. Yeah, and it's interesting. And what we do because... being, you know, a bunch of picaresques. Right, right. I yes. was going to say that the, the normal D and D campaign, of course, the, the oddity is that it, it it conceptually goes on forever, right? That that we right. don't really end the campaign; it goes on forever. So it doesn't that map to a larger work, maybe. But but the actual content, I think, of playing D and D is more like a a long series of little independent stories that often don't have much to do with each other, frankly. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. That's why I was thought it was fun to even make it more granular and to map the story to a room. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that, that sort of, you know, that each room is its own encounter, its own thing to have to negotiate, to have to deal with. How, did, uh, how long did you spend on that, Peter? And did you like really think hard about who gets the secret chamber and who gets to go? A little bit, room? yeah, a little bit. I mean, if you <laughs> okay. notice, right, there good, is, good, good. yeah, they actually like the CL Moore story. There's actually a little, um, there's a little uh, place where it's. Um, it's an astral portal that I have that you have to get to that room right. to get to the CL Moore story. You have to go through an astral portal. Nice. Um, there's a That's water crazy. for the Elric tale. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a yeah, little yeah. Bit. yeah right. But it's, it's funny thinking about it that way, though, because I'm playing with... I, I help... Um, I run a game as part of a clinic for kids who are on the spectrum to play D&D. &D. Awesome. And... Um, and but that's secondary to the fact that as as players, they are, and I don't know what it is about it, but you know whether it's video games or even just maybe some of the ways we conceptualize RPGs is that they find going room to room as a slog, and and they want to just get to the encounter. They just want to get to the fight, and what I've been trying to teach them is you know, it's not just about they what it's getting hard for them is to see each room as an encounter that when you get there suddenly all your skills now are suddenly useful 
you need to listen, you need to check for things, you need to have some, you need to understand where everybody's positioned in case somebody's coming from the rear, right? You need to be, so, but they, so I have to always remind them that each room is a, is a little mini moment to play D&D. The D&D doesn't just happen when you're fighting the main opponent or when you are, you know, there's a group of orcs or when you have to solve the giant puzzle. The D&D is happening at every, at every room, every encounter level. Mm-hmm. And so I think in some ways we, we've lost a little bit of this, at least what I'm seeing with a younger generation coming into play. It, they're just trying to get from room to room to get to the thing. Right. And and I remember playing, or at least how I like to play, is to think about the, the skills are not just for the big encounters. The skills are meant for that everything could potentially be the big encounter, and you have to treat it as such, you know. And so this gets to this idea of these stories really having more of that flavor, right? That even in its smallest form, these tales are these singular encounters, right? Um, rather than always thinking about the giant campaign and who, you know, and where everything, how you're going to get there in one day, you know, I don't even know, like you said, it just can go on forever. Right. Um, but it's interesting to see that play out. And I think, um, that's why in some ways personally, like I just love a good old fashioned dungeon crawl. Cause I just, I want to get that feel of that room to room experience, you know? That's great. That's great. Let me pitch. I got maybe a couple quick questions. I had a uh, question from uh, our friend Michael Rooney on Facebook actually the other day, asking, and and th- th- I guess we know this is a very niche question, asking if there's any evidence that Gygax had possibly read Legin, for example, Legin's A Wizard of Earthsea, because he felt there was a lot of the DNA, like we're talking about, in the Eldritch Wizardry supplement. You know, he, yeah, you have any idea I don't. That- I don't know. I see lots of Lovecraft in the Eldritch Wizardry supplement. I mean, you even have these sort of almost like alien tech type things, you know. Um, but no, I never know that. And I'm a huge fan of of um, of her work, especially the Earth. I think the Earth Sea is some of the finest fantasy that's ever written. That's great. That's great. And of course, you know, one of my main theses is that among all the the literature in Appendix N, I feel like the root, if I had to pick one root, is Lovecraft. Is we 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 can never have any of these conversations that Lovecraft doesn't come up. And if you dig into it, you know, he was uh, communicating with a lot of the other earliest pulp authors and encouraging exactly. them, and you know, helping getting yeah. them published. And so I feel if if you had to point to one you know, starting point, you know, Lovecraft tends to be it. Am I, am I crazy That's about right. that? No, no. And I even see the CL Moore is having that quality to it, you know, where yeah. it's what is the, the evil that you're encountering is so otherworldly. It's not just orcs, right? It's something that it, it changes, actually changes geometry, right? And, and I think there's a lots of Conan that tap into that. Um, and this is where we get to that. What is weird fiction, right? Weird fiction is slightly different from sword and sorcery because weird fiction is dealing with a sort of disruption of reality. Sword and sorcery tends to happen just sort of on the ground. Weird fiction tends to... But I do think that the mix of sword and sorcery and weird, we really are getting with things like, I, I think, even with some Conan material, with, obviously with Lovecraft, when he, when he wants to get to that sword and sorcery element, right? Um, like the Empire, you know, like, um, um, you know, some of the Dreamland stuff. Um, yeah. Obviously, Clark Ashton Smith, you know, um, I mean, it, you know, the Empire of the Necromancers is, is, again, not just a sword and sorcery story. It's bizarre. Yeah. Right? And there is a disruption of reality in, in sort of all these ways. And I like, I like the idea that D&D can withstand that even in a game, you know, um, that you can have these, these elements there. And so it, it elevates that pure sort of just 
you know, in the mud. It, it's the sorcery part of sword and sorcery. It's supposed to be weird and wrong, and you don't want to get near it, and that's where the trouble really is, though, and that's what's ruining everything. Um, and that's why I also think that in some ways, you know, the magic user, I think you see more of the kind of magic user I like in, in many ways in Chainmail because they're really just about the fog of war as opposed yep. to the wizard in the tower, you know? They're more like the druid of the Celts who always have their... Who always have you know who always have their druid on the battlefield to wave their skulls and their bones around to try to scare the other army right um and and that's very different from now obviously and even in first edition dnd where you can have a wizard's tower the wizard the wizard and the wizard's tower and sword and sorcery was always your enemy yeah. you didn't hang right. with that guy yeah you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, yep. that's, that's something that I wrestle with actually in yeah. D and D is a, matter, a lot actually. Is that is that if you dig into Conan, he he's just going to murder any wizard that he finds. How do I yes. massage that into a party where there's both, you know, Tolkien yep. style? And, that's, that's right. Father is great. I mean, even exactly. I mean, that's even you know, even Gandalf is um, he rarely uses magic. It, yeah. it, you know, right? It's not. It's and he Sauron. disappears at uncomfortable it, it, times. That's right, exactly. Not it's like Sauron that. who was that, that wizard in the tower, or even Sauron, right, that is right. always wielding magic, always trying to, uh, to change reality to suit their will, always, right? Interesting. Um, Here's my last question. I hope that it's brief. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, Paul. Um, you know, we, week after week, we have these conversations, and we wind up talking a little bit the last two months or so, about how much uh, secret science fiction is uh, injected into D and D in places, or you know stories like Vance's Dying Earth. How much? How much of this is secretly sci-fi? And you know, uh, we can like the you know I had a, I had an interesting discovery I think about a year ago when I discovered Alfred Bester's The Stars My Destination that has so everybody great. teleporting. And the exact mechanics in Bester are the exact mechanics you find for the teleport spell in original D and D. So there's there's a point in the old EN World Forum where someone asks Gygax about his sci-fi influences, and he just starts rattling off a, a huge list of sci-fi authors, just like Appendix N. And he goes, "Oh well, Asimov, Bradbury, Clark, Dick, Elkinson, Farmer, Gernsback," and he just goes on and on and on a bunch of a bunch of sci-fi authors. So my question is, is there any possibility for a follow-up to Appendix N where we look into the science fiction influences on Gygax and D&D? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a, it's a great question because, you know, half of the pulps that he was reading at the time were science fiction stories, right? Um, and it's really hard. I mean, obviously, Barrier Peaks is, you know, the one that everybody, you know, it has that very literal thing. Um, but it's it's hard to see it in the way except it unless you see it, which I think is great. What if what if we agree as a sort of collective of of D and D players in all its forms that the world in which all your campaigns exist is five million years from now? <laughs> all right. In a dot, you know, it's Book of the New Sun, it's Dying Earth, it's all of that, um, where the magic is an old technology that we just call magic because we don't know what else it is. I mean, you could easily imagine that being the case. There's nothing that suggests that D and D happens in the past, right, or in the medieval. It's not really a medieval game. Even though we, that's sort of the, the, I think the pastiche we put on it. Um, but I think that it, there's more of a case to be made to say that it's extra dimensional, far future Earth than it is any past, you know, of, of sort of our world, you know. Super well put. Stephen, I don't, I don't know if you can grab Stephen's comment there, Paul. I think we, I think we agree that, uh, as our viewer Stephen Wendell is saying, yeah, you're talking about the, sorry, uh, five, the most five, recent comment there. Five million years but yes, or so, or no? yes, five million exactly. years or so from now. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, exactly. Awesome. 
Yes. <laughs> great, great observation. <laughs> yes. And that could actually be a very cool, that, that's a great, uh, sort of really interesting idea for a campaign, too, that the palliators don't realize it, but solely what they're finding out artifacts of something that points to something, you know, else. But, and then do they ever, even, could you even conceive of that? You know, it's sort of like we could, it, it sort of, it would have to mythology, they could mythologize sort of their own Hyperborean Atlantean age, right? That's so in the past that, yeah. Dungeon Crawl so Classics would be even better, I think, for that kind of game. <laughs> Love DCC. <laughs> Uh, we are we are definitely now pushing past our, our time limit here. Uh, I did want to ask Peter one one just to sort of follow up there to what Dan was asking is is do you, is your work here done? Uh, do you think there will be a volume two? Well, I think the last part of um, Appendix N was a purely uh, extra thing that doesn't have anything to do with Gary Gygax, but has to do with my role playing life in the seventies. 80s, which is this sort of dragoness, which I'll just give you a little peek there, uh, by the great comic book artist Frank Brunner. And so what that was supposed to be is sort of a tease cliffhanger to a sort of appendix N squared that would be a much more, it would be what would be my appendix N mm -hmm. based on the influences, the things that influenced me um, at the time, right? What would I do? And, and so the D&D &D that I played. And so it would include, you know, uh, comic strips from Creepy and Eerie and maybe, a mo you know, something from Marvel or um, some, of you know, um, short stories by, um, you know, authors that are a little bit more contemporary to that time. Um, the other problem is, is I would also have to include on the list things like uh, maybe we could get some film stills from like Excalibur um, oh. or uh, Wizards, you know, Ralph Bakshi's Wizards, or even yes, believe yes. it or not, I mean, I don't think anything influenced, in some ways, I don't think anything influenced my own D&D &D as a kid than the Hobbit animated TV show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a classic. Like I never could not conceive of a wizard that didn't look like that Gandalf. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. Great choice. Um, yeah, awesome. So we are. We would love to see that. Yeah, we'll be we we'll be eagerly looking for what for you get you're doing that, Peter. Yeah, I hope so. So, um, viewers, if you uh, have some suggestions about what would go in your appendix, N, uh, leave us some comments here in the video. Uh, tell us tell us what uh, what's missing, uh, what, what goes into your appendix, N, and why that is so evocative for D and D. We'd love to hear from you. We definitely, definitely uh, will be looking for that. And remember, if you're new to the channel, that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs. We are on YouTube and Twitch and Twitter and Facebook and also GitHub. Um, and we have the handle Wandering DMs on all those sites. So please look for us there. If you prefer to listen to our show in audio-only podcast format, you can find those files at our website at wanderingdms.com, as well as various carriers like iTunes, Google Play, uh, Spotify, etc. Uh, if you are listening to us on one of those uh, third-party carriers, please take a moment to rate and review us there. That helps other users of that platform find us, and we really appreciate it. It really does. Uh, as usual, a huge thanks to our patrons of Wandering Dems that support this show. And if you're in a position where you can join them, please do visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs. And the tiers that we have on our patron uh, include discounts on merch, access to our private Discord server, um, uh, monthly behind the scenes videos, polls and surveys, as well as after party chat that we hold after every Sunday episode in just a couple minutes, as a matter of fact. Uh, Paul, what is your schedule for 10 Dead Rats now? Uh, we have switched officially to Mondays. So, uh, in fact, tomorrow uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern will be the next episode of 10 Dead Rats here on Wandering Dams. Very good. We'll look forward to that eagerly. Um, uh, and, uh, and other shows as well on the Wandering Dams channel. Peter, uh, thank you so much for joining us this, this week. This is one of our favorite things to do. So um, please do look for uh, Appendix N, the eldritch roots of Dungeons and Dragons. And whether you're a new player or an old player, you'll, you'll definitely find, uh, I think, uh, some, some great new stuff in here. And thank you. Thanks to Peter for putting this together. Thank you for having me. Really great. Really enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget that, of course, we, the Wandering DMs, are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So we do hope that you'll join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion.
We'll see you then.